This time on The Gadget Show. We're all over the globe, riding, driving, steering, gunning and thrashing some of the sexiest and most amazing gadgetry you'll find on any number of wheels. Whoa! I travel to Switzerland to drive a car on water. <laughs> Otis heads to the desert to test drive a sand bike that accelerates faster than a Ferrari Enzo. John finds out if we're looking at the end of the dedicated sat-nav on a trip to Paris. And I build the machine of my dreams, a proper working jet-powered hoverboard. Oh, yeah. Welcome to The Gadget Show. Now, this week, uh, we're doing a kind of transport special, but I've got to be honest with you, Suze, transport doesn't really work for me as a word, you know? No, no, I don't For me, mean. transport summons up images of sweaty waiting rooms in train stations or, you know, some lardy lorry driver pulling into a lay-by, munching on a burger with his bum cleavage out the window. <gasps> Do you know what I mean? A bit of man cleavage. A bit of man cleavage. Oh, it's not very sexy, not is it, least transport? Bit. And yet, all the stuff we've got on today's show is incredibly sexy. Yeah, very much so. So maybe, instead of a sort of transport special, we should think of it as a sexy stuff on wheels special. Oh, oh no, not wheels though. Yeah. Sexy stuff on air, nice. water, sand yeah. special. Okay, let, let me just tune you into what we're talking about here, okay? On today's show, you're going to see a jet-powered hoverboard. <gasps> is that sexy enough for you? That is sexy. All That's right. coming up later in the show, but to kick things off, I have got something to start with that's very sexy. Nothing new there then, eh? A few weeks ago, I drove some of the amazing concept cars made by Rinspeed, a small Zurich-based company who are known worldwide for creating truly unique futuristic vehicles. But there was one car there that was so awesome, so fantastical, that I just had to go back to Rinspeed the next day to experience it for myself. Costing a million pounds to build, the Splash is an amphibious vehicle like no other, and I was about to go for a spin in it. They weren't going to let me loose on Lake Zurich behind the wheel, though. Piloting it can be a tricky business, so I handed over the controls to Frank, Rinspeed's owner. At first, it seemed the Splash moved through the water just like every amphibious vehicle we've seen before. So a special gearbox is now transferring the power of the engine to the propeller instead of to the road wheels. But when Frank presses this magic button, it transforms itself. The bodywork opens up to reveal an extendable propeller that drops down into the water, and on either side of the car, V-shaped hydrofoil wings unfold and the spoiler rotates to form a tail wing. As Frank accelerated, the nose of the car rose up and it felt as if we were taking off as we flew across the water at 50 miles an hour. Incredible! The wings work in a similar way to aircraft wings. The pressure on the underside builds up as the speed of the splash increases until the car is lifted up and out of the water. Splash rises, a clever unfolding Z-shaped propeller shaft allows the pilot to adjust the height of the propellers to make sure that they always stay in the water. But keeping the car above the lake was not as easy as it looked. Frank had to delicately control the angles of the hydrofoils and the speed of the splash to maintain its balance. And when he got it wrong, it was me that knew about it. <laughs> and for some reason, it always seemed to be my side that ended up in the drink. Wait, the boat won't stop! But despite the soaking, my trip in the unique splash had been an experience I'd never forget. I'm not sure it's the best way to get to work, but it's bloody great fun. Oh, 
Oh. Susie, that was amazing. It was straight out of James Bond. I love the fact that it actually looked like a car and then it became this hydrofoil. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't stunning. it? Stunning. So where is it? Can I have a go? It's in Switzerland. No, but we, you know what it's like? We, we show the gadge and then you bring it into the studio and you give us a lot no, of spin. it was terrifying driving it. It's worth a million pounds. That's shocking. Can't let you in it. Right, time for a short break now, but we've still got lots of amazing gadget vehicles to show you. Yeah, later on, Otis will be trying to tame the beast of the desert that is the Sandex. Whoa! And I'll be test driving probably the coolest gadget I've ever built, my jet-powered hoverboard. This is Paris, one of the world's most magical cities, a must-see destination for any globetrotting tourist. I'm here on a day trip. I've got just eight hours to do a tour of some of its most famous landmarks, so I can't afford to hang around. Fortunately, I have the ideal car for my trip, a splendid 1988 Citroen Dercheveau Special with just 12,000 kilometres on the clock. But I'm going to need more than a set of wheels to achieve my tight sightseeing goal, because Paris is renowned for being one of Europe's most congested and confusing cities to pilot yourself around. Which is where these three devices should come to my aid, because each has been equipped with a satellite navigation function. But can they possibly do as good a job of guiding me as a dedicated sat-nav? Well, I'm here to find out. Now, here's my plan for the day. At the moment, I'm at the Sacre Coeur here, and I'm going to head south to visit Notre Dame Cathedral before nipping across to visit the Arc de Triomphe and then heading back across the river to finish up at the Eiffel Tower. And to maximise my sightseeing experience and make sure these devices are thoroughly road tested, I'm going to plug in a few waypoints. My first part time sat nav comes courtesy of a TomTom -Tom app on the iPhone. Go to the iTunes App Store and you can download a number of different mapping applications. I chose TomTom's version because you can also buy a purpose-built mount for it, which comes with a built-in speaker and an additional chip for better GPS reception. TomTom -Tom have also incorporated their IQ Routes feature, which uses data gathered from millions of motorists' actual journeys to recommend the best route for the time of day. I wonder what it'll recommend for... 11 a.m. and my journey to Notre Dame. Nothing I'm going to put in a waypoint for the Pompidou Centre. It's good clear screen. I mean, it's actually well, like having a normal Tom Tom. The voice instructions come through reasonably loudly on the cradle. After 200 yards, bear right. Thanks to the boosted signal from the TomTom -tom mount, the iPhone was performing admirably, and I was soon at my waypoint, the Pompidou Centre. However, I wasn't convinced that the TomTom -tom application was giving me much help with the traffic. Parisians are so impatient. There's no use hooting at me. Well, I was so much for these IQ routes. Well, maybe this could be unexpected congestion. It doesn't actually have the live traffic that you get on... Uh, proper tom-toms or the HD traffic. So you have to make do without those. Would they be useful? I can't tell. That question aside, I felt the iPhone had operated with the same efficiency as a normal tom-tom unit, and I was duly delivered to the front door of Notre Dame. Completed in 1345, its central window is a massive 13 metres in diameter. However, there was little opportunity to admire it because time was cracking on. For the next leg of my tour, I'd be using the Arcos 5 internet tablet. For an additional payment, this multimedia device can be equipped with sat-nav functionality provided by N-Drive. The Arcos has the luxury of a 5-inch screen, though you do have to plan ahead a bit more. For my trip to the Arc de Triomphe via a waypoint at the Louvre, for example, I've got to think ahead and plan an itinerary. And to get there, I have to go through the cumbersome menu system. My N drive, manage my itineraries, create one, put a place on it. Add POI, Paris, yes, culture, museum, Musée du Louvre. Add, add, POI, Paris, I would have put the town in again. Tourism, 3D land. Landmark. Arc and Triumph. Done. Itinerary. OK. Navigate. 250 yards. Turn right. I think we're there. Whew. Not quite such loud instructions as the iPhone, although it's a bigger unit. And it sounded a bit distorted as well. 
Honestly, I couldn't hear that over the noise of the engine. I rather like these 3D representations of local landmarks, though I suspect you won't be getting them if you're not in big cities like London and Paris. In spite of those few sound issues, the Arcos delivered me successfully to my waypoint. Well, sort of. Ooh, I've got a picture of the Louvre on here. Actually, this is taking me to a useless bit of the Louvre. You'd never want to go in there. It was time to move on, but at this point, the Arcos completely lost its bearings. Ooh, and we've lost the signal. Can't be no entry. It doesn't say no entry on here. Oh. However, it duly recovered, and I was back on my way. Ah, oh, the Champs-Élysées. And I, can, of course, can see the Arc de Triomphe. I'm getting myself primed, ready for Paris roundabout aggression. I'd reached my second destination, though the Arcos hadn't piloted me with anything like the confidence of the iPhone's TomTom. -tom. The Arc de Triomphe was commissioned by Napoleon to toast his many victories. Get out of my way! But my celebration at reaching the mighty arch had to be brief, as dusk was now falling. To make my final journey across town, I'd be using an adapted version of Sony's popular portable gaming console, the PSP. This is the Go Explore. You get Nav and Go software, including European mapping, fits onto this UMD disc that slots into the back of the PSP. You get a GPS receiver, which slots into the top of the PSP via its USB socket, and you get this mount to stick the PSP on your windscreen. The Go Explore mapping system can only be used on Sony's original PSP unit, not the new PSP Go, their mini handheld games console. And this really is the prettiest of the options so far. There's the ideal sat now for geographers and architecture students. You get lots of buildings all programmed in. However, as a navigational tool, the PSP screen didn't quite match the clarity of the iPhones, and the sound was also a bit weak. But the biggest problem was the lack of illuminated buttons, making it difficult to adjust the unit in the gathering gloom. Change view. Oh, that's a very wide view. And then the mount started to play up. Ah! Oh. Oh. Bloody hell. However, as I passed my waypoint... Oh, and here we are in the Place de la Concorde race. Splendid it looks too. I couldn't fault the actual navigational abilities of the PSP system. Directions are pretty easy to follow, though. Know what's coming up next. I felt the PSP was guiding me to my destination almost as well as the iPhone, though it hadn't proved as user-friendly. Ah, oh, well, I can see the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower is remarkable because it was only meant to be a temporary structure, so it shouldn't really be here. Happily it is, and so was I. But had the sat-nav add-ons performed as well as a purpose-built sat-nav? The Arcos certainly hadn't, and only gets two Gs. Although I liked the big 3D screen graphics, it was complicated to set up. It had a poor speaker and lost its way every now and then. The PSP with Go Explore gets three Gs. It provided good navigation, but was let down by an inadequate speaker and a lack of illuminated controls. So it too would be a questionable substitute for a dedicated system. But the TomTom equipped iPhone deserves 4Gs. It's easy to use and offers precise navigation. It's as good as a real TomTom. Just a pity it costs 60 pounds more than their comparable standalone unit. That was interesting. Fascinating, wasn't it? yeah. Yeah, it was interesting at the start of the piece in the studio. John was mentioning that this could be the death knell of a standalone sat nav. It's an interesting question, isn't it? It is, isn't it? But but the software that performed really well there was the TomTom on the iPhone. The other two weren't quite there no, yet. No, but they? you know, as technology evolves, as the chips that connect to satellites get smaller, then along with everything else, like HD video and and uh, you know all kinds of other you know projection and all the stuff that we're going to see in phones in the next five. Over 10 years, you know, it could well be the death knell for sat -navs. Yep, we'll have to wait and see. Right, it's almost time for the Wall of Fame, but just before we go and do that, remember about three weeks ago, Otis did a piece on the top five pocket tools with Mike Hawk. Well, at the time, we forgot to mention that, of course, carrying a locking blade is illegal unless you use it in your line of work, so sorry that we didn't mention that. Right, now it's time for the Wall of Fame.
Each week on the Wall of Fame, Jason and Susie each pick what they think is the most iconic gadget in a particular category. Yeah, then we both state our cases as to why our choices should be on the Wall of Fame. Yeah, John acts as judge and jury and decides which one he thinks is the best. And this week, it's a battle between what are probably the two most iconic cars of all time. The Beetle and the Mini. <laughs> It's the coolest, cutest and most chic set of wheels to ever hit the British highway. Yes, the gorgeous Mini just has to make it onto the Wall of Fame. Yeah, baby. It was created by the legendary designer Alex Zizagonis to be small, nippy and cheap to run. Yet it needed four seats and had to use a standard British Motor Corporation engine. Isagonis' brilliant solution was to mount the engine sideways, place the gearbox underneath and use front-wheel drive. Which meant that 80% of the space inside was dedicated to the passengers and their luggage. It was revolutionary. And the Mini has been the basis for small car design ever since. It hit the roads in 1959, costing £537, with a top speed of 72 miles an hour. And it sold over 5 million during its 40-year lifespan. It was dubbed the classless car because everyone wanted one, from factory workers to film stars. Owners included Peter Sellers and the Beatles, and even the coolest guy on the planet, Steve McQueen, had one. But in 1969, the Mini became a film star in its own right, with its central role in the Italian job. The Mini zipping along British roads was like roast beef on a Sunday. It was a British institution. Various different models like the Mini Traveller, the Mini Countryman and the Mini Clubman have graced our highways. And the Mini Van was particularly popular with businesses as well as roadside repair teams. Not to mention the Mini Cooper S, which won the Monte Carlo Rally three times during the 1960s. There's absolutely no way you can deny this mini masterpiece of place on our prestigious Wall of Fame. It's a British icon and it changed driving forever. It's already been voted the car of the century and this year it's 50 years old. And look John, I got you one for your mantelpiece. Groovy. Come off it, Mr Bean drove a Mini, whereas my vehicle is the very epitome of cool. Peace, love and happiness. Yeah, man. I'm, of course, talking about the VW Beetle. It all started in 1933 when Hitler ordered his pal, Ferdinand Porsche, to design a people's car, or Volkswagen. This had to be a cheap, basic vehicle, capable of carrying four people at speeds of up to 60 miles an hour. Porsche got to work and five years later came up with his motor masterpiece. It had a lightweight air-cooled engine, which was mounted at the back of the car for better traction. But as soon as mass production got the thumbs up, it ground to a halt as the Second World War broke out. But when the war was over, and under the supervision of British Army officer Major Hurst, production was back up and running. In fact, the British government was so impressed with the German car, they ordered 20,000 of them. Due to its shape, the Volkswagen became affectionately known as the Beetle. And by 2003, when the last Beetle rolled off the assembly line, it had become the longest running and most produced automobile of a single design. As for Caesar's car being a movie star, the Beetle is a proper Hollywood movie legend. It's been in all five of the Herbie movies and it's got serious gadget movie credentials. Bumblebee transforms into a Beetle in the movie Transformers. You don't get much better than that. The Beetle is a cult classic and has become synonymous with cool. It's not a big fire-breathing, fuel-munching supercar, but it's way cooler than any Ferrari, Lamborghini or Maserati could ever be. I mean, people who drive those have crease lines in their jeans, for goodness sake. The VW Beetle is the funkiest car on the planet. Since they first went into production, 21 million of these cars have been sold. No wall of fame is complete without a VW Beetle. It's historic gadge perfection on wheels. Thank you very much. Very interesting. As ever, though, a couple of questions. Jason, the Beetle, lovable in many ways. I mean, it's my first car, actually, and I've still got it. Oh. But it's never been very good to drive. You know? Oh, no, I absolutely agree. A complete pig to drive. <laughs> Completely awful, and the, and the heater doesn't work either. But, do you know what? There's just something about the Porsche design of this car that's just so cool. It just aches to have a surfboard on it and someone dressed similar <laughs> to me driving it. it. It's just a really, really cool car. Mmm, and Susie, the Mini, 
Whereas the Beetle was a huge world success, they sold over 20 million of them, and then he managed to sell 5 million minis. Oh, yes, but this is the wall of fame, not the wall of sales, John. This is about true icons. Look at this little British beauty. It's like a TARDIS, so small on the outside, and inside, so roomy. Very difficult to decide. I mean, both these cars are so sort of cool and iconic. I mean, you could argue forever about Herbie versus the Italian job, but I think it comes down, actually, to a battle of technology and which car was the most influential and therefore the winner is the Mini Yay! car. It was Woo! brilliantly designed, superbly packaged and basically the template for small cars ever since. And for those reasons it deserves its place on the Gadget Show's Wall of Fame. Yeah, baby. Right, time for another short break now, but still to come. Otis test drives a sand bike that accelerates faster than a Ferrari Enzo. And the wait is almost over. Soon I will reveal my truly awesome jet-powered hoverboard. Welcome back. Now it's time for this week's top five. And sticking to our theme of cool, sexy gadget rides, I've got something for you now on two wheels. Our top five 50cc scooters. I've gathered together 18 of the best 50cc scooters and bought them to this go-karting track in East London. Now, in order to get this selection of 50cc scooters down to our top five, I've got some serious testing to do. First of all, I'm going to get rid of those that I think aren't a good buy. When you buy a scooter, you should think long term like you do when you buy a car. So you should think about maintenance, servicing. If you can't get the parts, then what's the point of buying it? And then, of course, there's a the question of style. I mean, would you like to go on your first date on this? In the world of scooters, looks really do matter. Nobody wants to ride around in the equivalent of a reliant Robin. It's quite frankly... Disgusting, sorry. So I made my way around the scooters and wheeled away the ones that didn't make the grade. This one looks like a hunk of junk. It's very, very plasticky. No chance. That's bad. So now we're down to ten. Obviously, when you're nipping around town on your scooter, handling is vital. So I'm going to take all of these on there to test their manoeuvrability and agility. As a commuter, it's vitally important that you're able to power your way out of trouble and keep up with the traffic. So I'm going to find the five that will cut it out on the busy city roads. This is me, flat out. It's not easy to turn, it's not nimble. Nice soft braking. Pretty good acceleration. Obviously, this bike's aimed at the young, sporty, nutty market, and it's lovely. I would describe it as being fairly sluggish. It's iconic, it's beautifully styled. I think this scooter's one for getting the paper on a Sunday morning, and that's about it. Do you know what? This has been one of the hardest top fives I've ever done on The Gadget Show. I came here today expecting to test the load of hair dryers masquerading as bikes, but I've been really pleasantly surprised by the quality. So, after much deliberation and a bit of head scratching, here are our top five 50cc scooters. At number five, it's the Peugeot Speed Fight 3. The Peugeot has really good acceleration, so you can really get yourself out of a tangle sticks to the road beautifully. Number four is the Piaggio NRG. Very comfortable, very stable, seems to hold the road very nicely. Seems fairly smooth, brakes well. The number three spot goes to the Kimco Super 8. Unlike some other two strokes, this is quite smooth. This is a bike that you feel that you can just throw around. Keep the revs on. Always really lovely to ride. At number two, it's the Yamaha Neo. For a 50cc bike, this Yamaha is pretty enjoyable to ride, I would say. And I think it looks pretty smart. And our number one 50cc scooter is the beautiful Vespa S. 
I love the fact that it has a retro feel. I love the chrome dash. Accelerates well, holds the curves beautifully. What's not to like about a Vespa? That looked like fun, Sue. It was a great morning's filming. Just buzzing about that little track. It must yeah. have been great. All tight and twisty. I I've got to say, I did agree with you. The Vespa looks I knew you'd like business. that one. <laughs> In fact, if you'd like to win your own Vespa, as featured in Susie's Top 5 Scooters, uh, then listen carefully, because we're about to tell you about this week's competition. Yes, but that's not all you can win in this week's competition. Because we are also giving away six tickets to Gadget Show Live that takes place from the 8th to the 11th of April at the NEC next year. That'll give you access to all four halls of the exhibition full of tech. And we'll also throw in six VIP tickets to our 4,000-seater Super Theatre, where you can come and see Susan, John, Otis and I perform a live version of the Gadget Show. For more details and to buy tickets, go to our website. That's 5.tv slash gadget show. And be warned, the show is selling out fast. And if you win the competition so that you don't have to worry about transport, we will lay on a limo to collect you from your home, take you to the exhibition, and then take you home again afterwards. Wow. You're also going to get a whole bunch of tech if you're lucky enough to win. In fact, so much tech, you could probably put your own gadget show live on. Here's the list of the stuff you just might win. <laughs> As well as a Vespa S scooter that was number one in my top five, you could also win an Apple iPhone plus the TomTom Tom app and in-car cradle that came top in John's test. And a 50-inch plasma TV, a 32-inch LCD TV, a Blu-ray player and 20 Blu-ray movies. A high-end desktop gaming PC and a MacBook laptop, a Canon Pixmar printer, a Helimission RC toy, a Panasonic TZ7 compact digital camera and a Nikon D90 SLR. A Wii, a Wii Fit, a DSi and an Xbox 360, a PS. PS3, a PSP Go, a Paramount gaming chair and a whole load of games for all the consoles. A swap watch, a GoPed Noped and a pair of Salomon walking boots, an Apple iPod Touch, an Arcos 5 media player, a 5.1 surround sound speaker system and a pair of Denon headphones. A high-def Panasonic camcorder, a Sony reader, a bulletproof USB memory stick and an Oral-B Triumph electric toothbrush, a Tonium portable DJ system and a B&W Zeppelin mini iPod dock. And a Berghaus Bioflex rucksack, a copy of Windows 7 software, a Magimix 2000 food processor, and a Yogi Gatekeeper Pico, a Flip Video Ultra, and a Griffin Bluetooth headset. A Brompton folding bike, a Philips juicer, a flat light, a Dyson Ball vacuum, a Sony digital photo frame. All that, plus six tickets to the Gadget Show Live from 8th to the 11th of April next year at the NEC in Birmingham, plus a limo to take you there and back again. It's a prize fund worth nearly 16 and a half grand. And to be with a chance of winning the lot, you'll need to know the answer to this question. Which of the following landmarks would you find in Paris? A, the Eiffel Tower, B, the Colosseum, or C, the Acropolis? To enter, call 0904 1616 or text A, B or C to 6355. Or send your answer, name and contact telephone number on the back of a postcard or sealed envelope to Gadget Show 17, PO Box 46556, London N1 0WW. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday the 30th of November and two days later for postal entries. Of course, we'll show you the question again at the end of the show. Good luck. Right, I think it's only fair that I should tell you that we are about to press the turbo booster and possibly mix in a little bit of testosterone because in a few minutes, Jason is going to show you how to build possibly the coolest machine that he has ever made, a jet-powered hoverboard. Mm -hmm. But first of all, Otis in the desert on a bike, the likes of which you have never seen before. <laughs> This is the Sandex. It's a dune bike designed for no other reason than to go as fast as possible and have as much fun as possible, as I was about to discover in the deserts of Dubai. It's the brainchild of four-time world snowboarding champion Urs Iselin. I guess he must have got bored with all that snow and wearing big jackets. Urs, uh, this machine looks like a, a customised snowmobile. Tell me about it. Most of the parts are coming from the snowball industries like chassis parts, seats, 
the dashboard. We had to change a lot of parts which makes it happen to, to drive around this scenery when it's 50 degrees. So it starts with the big rubber track. Uh -huh. So this track is made as rubber and Kevlar, which allows you to drive even when it's sand sometimes gets 100 degrees. Right. You see also here the suspension system is all custom made. All the bearings are very close because the sand is like dust. It's fine, yeah. It's not sand like we have in, in Europe. Okay. Also, we have custom made tires which are specially made for deep sand and uh, the cooling system must be very powerful in these temperatures which we have here in the UAE. Uh, what type of person buys a machine like this? It's more than 80 percent royal families from Middle East. These people they are used to very fast cars, yep. very fast bikes and they always they need the, the latest toys on the market. How fast can they go? Top speed of this machine is approximately 190 kilometers per hour yep. in the desert. We have an acceleration from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 2.7 seconds. <laughs> the only trouble is, this latest model of the Sandex with its 800cc two-stroke engine is by all accounts a bit of a beast, so Urs thought it probably best that I started out on an older model with a lot less power. Oh, wow! So off I went, expecting a pretty rough ride, but this Sandex Desert Patrol was actually a lot smoother than I thought it would be. Oh, it feels amazing! It feels really weird being able to manoeuvre on sand like this. It wasn't long before I was throwing it into a few corners. The turning is better than I thought it would be, although you really do have to give it some steer and some real throttle to turn into your corners. That's the back swinging out a little bit there. Granted, I wasn't on the big dunes yet, but thanks to its low centre of gravity giving me extra stability, it wasn't long before I had the confidence to give it some throttle. When you want it to go fast, no questions asked whatsoever. She really does just open up. Amazing fun out here in the desert on one of these. <laughs> I think after that tremendously successful practice run there, I'm ready for the black one. Let's go, mate. As soon as I started out on the 800R, I could immediately feel the difference in power. Already much scarier. A simple twist of the throttle sent me hurtling across the sand dunes, and it took me by surprise. Whoa! 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 I would got the hang of the Desert Patrol vehicle pretty quickly, but this was a whole different beast. Between you and me, I lost my ball a bit coming over that big one. Woo! Keep that quiet, do you? My director had asked me to do a running commentary of how it felt to ride, but the truth is it took all my concentration just to control the thing. Talking was the last thing on my mind. In fact, one momentary lapse almost sent me flying. was when I hit the floor, I threw forward, smacked my knee on it. I'm in agony right now, but it's all right. Like the Desert Patrol version, this has a low center of gravity, and the width between the two front wheels means that even with me at the controls, there's no chance of it rolling over, unlike a quad bike. And the progressive suspension system means that you don't feel any of the bumps in the dunes. It's as smooth as a baby's bum. It can carry loads of up to 300 kilos, so it's easy to see why it's becoming more and more popular for military patrol missions. It beats a camel hands down, if you ask me. How wow. awesome Super am I? Air. It was so much fun. You were flying at certain oh. points. That I took know. a lot of courage. So fast. Extraordinary. Wow. We are a little bit envious of that trip. I've got it mildly. In fact, I've got to say, there was one thing I'm a little bit disappointed about. You didn't bring one back to the studio, <laughs> dude! <laughs> These are the toys of the richest families in the United Arab Emirates. One sheikh requested 25 of them for a party that would just last one whole weekend. Probably <gasps> wasn't going to use them again. I want an invite to that party! Look, I'm still disappointed. <laughs> you could have talked to your sheikh friends. I'm sure they could have organised. It. Uh, same with you, Miss Rinspeed. I want to have a go in that. But listen, I have delivered on my promise. Check it out. <gasps> what do you think's under that shroud? John Bentley. <laughs> okay. I, I certainly hope not. What I'm hoping is underneath there uh, a jet-powered hoverboard. Do you want to oh, see it? Right. Yes, yes, yes. yes. 
Well, you have to wait until after the break. Welcome back. Now, we've been talking about this throughout today's episode of The Gadget Show, and finally, the time has arrived to see what all the fuss is about. This is the gadget build that I'm most excited to have been involved with. This is science fiction made real. Already, uh, they're talking about this on the internet, on Twitter, forums are talking about it. It's very, very exciting. And here it is for you. <laughs> It's fair to say that we love our builds on The Gadget Show, as over the course of 12 series, we've designed, crafted and tested a raft of awesome machines. But for me, there was one build project that stands out the most. My homemade hoverboard, powered by a single garden leaf blower. But while my initial design was genius, it lacked any thrust or steering. In fact, the only way I got going was thanks to my producer and a great big stick. But now the time had come to do things properly, so I went to meet expert engineers Simon Oldfield and Stuart Parrish, who were going to help me make Project Thrust become a glorious reality. So I'll show you some footage yeah, from, the, yeah, uh, from the first efforts that I made. That is a working the, hoverboard right there. Yep. Yeah? But the thrust is the thing that I always dreamt of putting on it but could never actually make it work. In fact, I was thinking possibly of a jet. More power. More power! I like the way you boys think. <laughs> Simon and Stuart were just the guys to build my design, but I also needed someone with a jet engine. I'm gone. I'm going to get myself okay. a jet engine. And I knew just the man. Ali Mashinchi, a long-term friend who designs model aircraft powered by mini gas turbine engines. So, Ali, is this my engine? It is indeed. Fantastic. Tell me about it. Um, it's basically, to simplify, it suck, bang, blow. It's... OK, excellent. So air is sucked in. Indeed. And then it's mixed with fuel in the combustion chamber, creates the explosive part, then it's put to the back end through the turbine wheel and throws it out of the back end at a very high speed, which is what we call the exhaust efflux. Is this going to provide us with enough power, do you think? Hell yes. Oh, I like oh. your response! You, you can't beat a hell yes. With an engine sorted, I got cracking on the board. I started by rounding the edges of a 2.5 metre long piece of marine plywood, cut holes at each end for our leaf blowers, then lined the base with durable plastic pond liner. And there's my power source. Lighter, smaller and four times more powerful than the original engine I used on hoverboard version 1.0. But to make things even better, because I'm going to have a jet engine and a little bit more weight, I've got two of them! Now here's the sciencey bit. So the air comes in here, and it comes in here, and it inflates the plastic on the back. This, however, the grommet, as I call it, essentially makes an inflatable donut, which if I ran the two engines without doing anything else, would just go bang. This would inflate and pop. However, if I place some holes around the grommet using this punch, then this inflates, the air will escape through the holes, and that's how the cushion of air will be created on which I will ride. Project Thrust was starting to take shape, and having mounted the leaf blowers that would inflate the pond liner, it was time to fit Ali's engine. We ideally need to put it on the centre line of the wall to start, so the thrust is pushing us as straight as possible. Yeah. Um, and then we mount it upwards. What that'll do, it'll give us what we call down thrust. It'll help keep the board down. So I went off to knock up a rigid stainless steel frame while Stuart and Simon built the pivoting mount and twin 7-litre fuel tanks. You know what, I love my job. What did you do today, Dad? Oh, I just bought a jet engine onto a hoverboard. Ali then programmed a handheld remote to control the engine's thrust level and its pivot angle. Oh! Oh, my God! Al, it is absolutely <laughs> amazing! <laughs> All that remained was to apply some gadget show livery and buff up the metalwork. The hard work was finally over. Project Thrust was ready. With two leaf blowers pumping 800 cubic metres of air an hour, and a butt-clenchingly powerful 60-pound thrust engine. All was set for my first test run along this 1.2-kilometre stretch of army runway. Uh, I've got to say, I've got that familiar feeling in the pit of my stomach that I get every so often on the gadget show, this ominous feeling that I'm about to do something really, really stupid. 
but fortune favours the brave, apparently. So after we fired her up, I bravely pushed the throttle forward. <laughs> That's it, brilliant! I feel like an evil Bond villain! The RPM of the turbine was steadily increasing. Can you hear that thing? Fuel was rushing in from the twin tanks at a rate of 30 ounces per minute. Project Thrust was working! It's so amazingly responsive. I mean, it's quite counterintuitive. As I turn here, it's really quite difficult to balance torque and control. But just as I was getting a grip of the controls, disaster struck. Whoa! Engine's gone down. We've got some malfunction. Rainwater had shorted the engine's electrics, causing the fuel pump to burn out and break. And no fuel meant no thrust. We were devastated. But amazingly, just as the rain clouds parted, Ali got the engine working again. However, we quickly diagnosed another problem. Our pivoting bracket wasn't responding anymore. But that wasn't going to stop me. I attached a rudder handle to the engine and opened it up. Spool it up for the power! Let's go, go, go! Oh, <laughs> Finally, I was reaching the hair-raising speeds I dreamed of. The power of this thing is way beyond anything I've ever experienced on the gadget show. This is really quick! This is the run I was looking for! Oh, that is the way! That is the way to drive! Oh, <laughs> absolutely amazing! Oh, it really worked! Awesome, wasn't it? It was, it was. Do you know what? The tech in this week's show has been absolutely astounding. It's been really good I fun, think you should try it. Can we yes, 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 try? yes. I'm going to start it up. There we go. That's it. Get on the front, guys. Wait. Woo! Next time on The Gadget Show, it's our winter special. Otis and I face a fierce, freezing challenge in the very highest bit of the Alps. Oh. They ride, they fall, oh. they get back up again and carry on testing a whole range of winter tech. But who will be crowned Gadget King of the Snowy Mountains? <laughs> Meanwhile, John and I will be staying safe and warm indoors, testing the very best party console games you can buy. That's next week. But right now, before the credits roll, remember to enter this week's incredible competition, as well as all the tech you see flying across your screen right now. We're also giving away six tickets to next year's Gadget Show live exhibition at the NEC in Birmingham between the 8th and the 11th of April, including VIP tickets to the Super Theatre and a limo to take you to the show and drive you home again. It's an incredible prize fund worth nearly £16,500. And to be with a chance of winning it all, you'll need to know the answer to this question. Which of the following landmarks would you find in Paris? A, the Eiffel Tower, B, the Colosseum, or C, the Acropolis? To enter, call 0904 161655 or text A, B or C to 63555 or send your answer name and contact telephone.